So we are going to look at one more limit theorem or uh, bound. Uh, this is the most uh, popular uh, result of the entire probability uh, course. Uh, we looked at the following thing. One is the weak law of large numbers. Then this form large numbers. In continuation, we are going to look at this so-called CFP or central limit theorem. So what we do is, as usual, we will look at IID random variables. We will denote it as X1 x2 to xn and the samples from these random variables xn. Then what for these two uh, limit theorems what we did is we investigated the way the sample mean m1 that is equal to x1 plus x2 to xn by n. How will it behave? Okay. So based on that, we define these two uh, uh, limit theorems. Uh, so what we generally saw is that the expectation of m will be equal to expectation of x, which is the expectation of this uh, identical distribution, E of x, and then variance of x are all known. So this we denoted by mu, this we denoted by sigma square. Then we also looked at the variance of m and it become equal to sigma squared by m. So by performing the sample mean, computing the sample mean, you are not touching or changing the uh, mean, but the standard deviation gets reduced. Okay. The more the number of samples you take for sample averaging, the variance reduces. That is how we, uh, that was the premises with which we started using MN as an estimate for the expected. Okay. So this is what we do. But this theorem is a much more powerful theorem. What it does, it only tells about the way the, uh, the sample mean sample uh, the average that behaves their expectation varies but, but otherwise these random variables can be arbitrary random variables. <coughs> but what this central limit theorem tells is the behavior of this uh, sample mean will be such that it will converge to a normal distribution. What it does. That is, we look at a uh, case that we just take it as z, okay, which is x1 plus x2 plus xn. Okay. And then what we will do is we know that its mean is going to be n times mu. So we would like to get a mean of 0. Therefore, we will do this. And its variance is going to be what? Uh, sigma squared by n. Okay? But if you look at the variance of this one, what will happen? If you take the variance of this, <coughs> this is a constant whose variance will be 0. It will be n times the variance of this. Okay? This is what you have. But moment you divide it by 0, it will be 1 over n squared. So if you will divide it by, Okay. Uh, sigma into root n. Okay. Let let just look at this. One. Uh, if you do that, you will see whether this is right or not. P of z. If you look at, then 
when you take an expectation, then these are all constant. That is not going to play a role. Only we have to, this will play a role and that will become equal to 0. Variance of z. What you have to do is, this factor is not going to affect. Only this factor will have an effect. When you take a variance. So, we have to square it. Okay? <coughs> that is sigma root n the whole square plus middle and n times the variance of this one which is sigma square. Then what happens? This is equal to 1. Right? So, but if you, instead of looking at the sample mean, if you define this <coughs> the random variable, and then you will find that its mean becomes 0 and its variance becomes 1. That is just, it just follows from the theorem of expectation variance. Nothing new in that one. It, always, it is going to happen because we have done, manipulated accordingly. If you have not manipulated, we simply take all x1 plus x n, then if we can find for anything, x1 plus x n, if you look at it, then it means will be n times 0, its variance will be n times sigma square, yeah. It will all follow from that one. So again it is something new. But what is the beauty of the central limit theorem is, then z will converge to not just a random variable with zero mean and unit variable, mean, that is a random variable. But what it tells is, we convert to the standard normal random variable with mean 0. That is standard one. Okay. Normal random variable or a Gaussian distribution with 0 mean and unit. So that is what it does. Whatever may be the IID random variable that you take, but if you perform this operation, then it will convert to a standard normal distribution. So, but the proof of it is we will not get into it. It's a complex point. So, it basically, uh, uh, if you look at the you know, one uh, zero one uniform distribution, we saw this is how the uh, if I call it as x, x one only, x one is that. This is how the f x one of x will look at. Right? F x of x if you f x is common. Okay, this is how we will look at. Then we saw that how x1 plus x2 distribution will be. Sum of two random variables convolution. We saw that it will be of the two, it will be something like this. Okay. If you moment you take three, then it will what will happen is it will become something like this. It becomes it becomes immediately start AMA like that. And if you more you take it, it will approach normal. This is how it happens. Again, it can be shown that using the convolution of n fold convolution, it can show that that kind of a convolution, whatever may be this function, it approaches the normal distribution. That is how the proof goes, but we will not get it. Okay, we will to just and, uh, look at how, how it can be applied. You will take an example. This example is given in the book. Okay. Use that one. Uh, suppose uh, you have, okay, you run a Fourier series. So what you do is you you are in a uh, large city like Chennai, and then you get parcels, and then you send it to a specific overseas country, like France or Germany. This is what you. Do. And then you what you do is you get packets for parcels for many people customers. You put it all together, and then you have to uh, send it over. Uh, to, to other country by booking it in a flight, car flight. This is what you do. So again, what you do is how much factor that you are going to get is a variable one. You don't know how much it is going to get. And what will be the rate of the each factor you don't know. That depends upon the customer. So if you tell that today I will come up with some 5 kgs, tomorrow I will come up with 100 kgs and so on, the cargo person will 
in, uh, what you will do is, oh, depending upon how much kg is there, we give you a per kg rate and so on. Okay. But if it is, no. I will guarantee that I will, I will pay you for 3000 kg. Okay. Every day. Whether it is less, if it is less, I don't mind. Okay. I will pay you. Give me a good rate. Then he may give a good rate because he is getting a guaranteed money. Okay. So, you can tell that you book, make a deal to that you will book for 300 kgs in every cargo flight that flies. And for that you get a very sweet deal. That makes sense. But, and you will all, let us say, you take 100 customers pass it every time and then you close it. <coughs> okay. So, and then use it. Now what happens here is, if as long as the total weight is less than 3 kg, you lose something, but because of the deal, it may be advantageous now. But quantity takes is 3 kg, 3000 kg, then for every extra kg, you will charge in a different amount. That is going to be very, it's not a good way. So you don't want that to exceed 3000 kg. So that's what you are trying to look at. Let us assume that each parcel uh, weight, this is the each parcel. Okay. It is uniform between 5 and 50. So it can be 5 kg or up to 50 kg and it is uniform. This is what you have found. So and you are going to take up to 100 parcels and you are going to see. Okay. So assume that there are 100 parcels. Otherwise, you can get it from someone and then use it. So, so what the, you are looking at the sum of these hundred parcels. What is the probability it exceeds exit three thousand? That is what you are interested. In. And you want to keep the probability in a controllable manner. So, this is what you are going to do. So, let the x one, x two, x hundred be the weight of hundred parcels. And what is the range, what is the values, this extreme values you can take? One of them can be 5 kg into 100, 500 kg. This is one extreme. The other extreme is, all of them can be 50 kg. Then it will be 5,000 kg. You are looking for a case that most of the time you will end up getting less than 3 kg. So this is what you So, what we are interested is in, what is the total, we will call it as yes, <coughs> yes for sum. 100, because we are summing it over 100 such random variables, which is x1 plus x2 plus x. Okay. And what will be the uh, probability that s100 will be less than, this is what we are looking for, probability that s100 will be less than or greater than the this is what you are looking at. Okay. So for that we have to find the individual means let us say. X, which is the form one of them, X is uniform phi to four. What is the expectation of X? It is uh, <coughs> And what is the variance of x? It is uniform between 5 to 5. If it is u of a to b is that, then variance of x is b squared minus a squared by 5. So from that we find it is can someone quickly compute it? I recall a number from what I read, it is 2500 minus 25 by 12, it will be from 168 or something like that, 170 or something like that, that's what it is. Well, now yes sir, that So now you have to find what it is. Okay, what is the probability and so on? So what we are going to do is we are going to apply a central limit. 
we assume that SL, uh, this one, this random variable will converge to be a normal random variable. Okay? So, well, how we are going to do is, to what random variable a hundred will come? That is what we are going to do. But what it tells is there are different ways of stating the uh, central limit theorem. If you do n mu minus sigma n mu, then it converges to standard norm. <coughs> but if you simply find the x1 plus the x2 plus the xm, <coughs> if you look at, it will converge to a normal random variable with mean as n into mu. And variance will be what? Uh, n sigma square. This is how it is from the So, if it, if any IN is random variable, in the limit of large n, if you find that sum, the mean of, mean of that will be n mu, which has to be true. Variance will be n times the variance of individual, n times sigma square. That is also obvious. But CLT tells that it will be n, it will be normal. That is the beauty of that. Okay. That is what it does. So from that it is called follow. Okay. What will be the uh, we can uh, try to apply this one. Uh, this will be yes, uh, uh, we are looking at it has to be greater than 3000. Okay. That is 3000 minus. Okay. What you put is 3000, what is the problem? 3000 minus n hundred <coughs> times the mu, which is 27.5. We look at this quantity that you are looking at for, for the 3000. 3000 minus n into mu divided by uh, n sigma, so root of okay, uh, sigma square n. I can write it as root of n into sigma square, like that you can write. Okay. That is root of 100 into <coughs> this 168. Okay. So, so this would be the, uh, if it converges to the normal distribution, then it will be the probability that x is less than or equal to x greater than x, the random variable, is greater than this value where x is a standard <coughs> normal. Because of this, we have again brought it back to the standard normal format. Okay? So this is what we have to find out. That you can find out that then that will be nothing but the uh, CDF of the standard normal CD evaluated at this point. So that will turn out to be something like a 2 or 1.9 or something like that. Huh? So that value, we can use the normal distribution table back. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1 minus. Okay, good. Yeah. 1 minus the value of the So that you can find out. And it will be, uh, this would be around 1 minus. 1.9 something else. So that probability will be very small. Point now. So this is how you can apply the general limit. Then all these things, this tells basically the, the uh, this random variable x1 to x7 converges to x7. It becomes standard. So that 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 is that brings. Uh, uh, to an important thing which is called as the convergence. Of a random sequence. <coughs> that is why here what you do is you define a sequence of random variables. Okay? That is that x1, x2, x3, xm, be a sequence. Random variables. See, it's, now it's a different, 
way of no, uh, notation. X1, X2, Xn are not n in the IID randomly. That was, that's all over now. What I am telling is, I am defining a random variable which is a function of m. The definition itself will incorporate dm. <coughs> okay? So, as that increases, the random variable definition will change. So, it is a random variable which changes. Okay? As the index changes from 1, 2, 3, 4 of the m. And we are interested that in law, when m is large, how do you characterize this random variable? That is what my question is. Okay? How do you characterize this random variable when m is large? That m can also be defined like this one. For example, m1 can be that m. m1, m2, m3. What is m1, m2, m3? <coughs> M1. These are all sample means by taking so many samples. When you look at M1, it will be X. You know its distribution and so on. M2 can also be found out using convolution and so on. When N is large, how will you characterize M1? Is the question. Okay. So this is a sequence of random variables. M1 is a random variable, M2 is a random variable. So you have a sequence of random variables in an asymptotic limit. How does that sequence of random variables <coughs> converge? What will happen to it? That is what we are going to invest. Okay. So that is called as the convergence. So in order to get into it, you will look at what is being really mean by convergence in an ordinary sense or convergence of a number. Of a sequence that you would have encountered in an algebra. For example, you would have seen, seen that okay, uh, n is an integer, okay, varying from 1, 2, 3, and so on. You may look at 1 over n, and the behavior of 1 over n in the limit large. Okay. So you know that when n is large, it approaches <coughs> okay, uh, 0. And or you can say n over n plus 1. So this I will call it as xm. xm is equal to n by n plus 1. In the limit n tends to uh, infinity, then this spins approaches 1. How do we write it? That you take any epsilon, however small it may be, I can always find a number n naught such that mod of xn minus the limit, which we call it as x, in this case it is 1, xn minus x. To be uh, xn minus 1 is uh, less than this epsilon for all n greater than n naught. Okay, so what the sequence, convergence of the sequence we mean is that is, okay, if we say it converges and the limit is x, for any given small number epsilon, uh, mod of xn minus x, you can find an n naught such that mod of xn minus x will be less than that epsilon for all n greater than n. If this happens, then we say that xn converges to this is how you normally mean by a convergence of a sequence. Okay? Series and sequence you should have studied in earlier. In a similar manner, you are want to define convergence for random basis. So x1, x2, xn are all just like that n by n of one, they are all random variables. As n changes, it changes. So it should converge. Naturally, it is not going to convert to a number. It is going to convert to a random variable, which means that still it will be random. When you do an experimentation, you do not take a given value. It may take different values, but that probabilities would have settled down. You will be able to characterize it. So in asymptotic limit, this xm will convert to a random variable. And what is that limit? That is what we are going to do. So again, whatever I am going to tell, I am going to only state the different conversion. Not, we are not going to prove. That will be involved. You should be aware of this. Uh, this. So, first thing is, <coughs> x1, 
x and one, if it converts to x, what we, one way in which is, let us look at the sample space. Yes. Okay. In which the random variables are there. See, all these random variables have to be defined in the same probability space. <coughs> okay, x, f, and then b. This is the sample space, yes. This is the sigma algebra that is the even space defined on, on this sample space which are closed under a finite set union and set intersection operation and a probability measure defined on each even of this. You cannot have different random variables defined on different even space. That's not happening. It should be in the same way. So for, if you look at a sample point xi uh, in this one, then first of all, if we convert this xn of xi, to be equal to x of n. This probability one, that is what? That is what it means is, see, when the even uh, the sample point psi occurs, then when xn maps on to a given value in this one, and if the random variable x should also map to the same value, Okay, because what can happen is as x1 x2 we keep defining the events may be back to different values. But if x takes a given value uh, for a given sample points, this converged that limit should also <coughs> take the same value. And and probability that this happens is what? <coughs> If this happens, then for every sample point it converges. So this sort of convergence is called as almost everywhere convergence. Or in, in short, A convergence. <laughs> For every sample point, it converts. The other one is convergence in probability. That is probability that x m minus mod of x m minus x okay, is greater than epsilon for any f, for finite value epsilon. Okay tends to 0 as it can tend to 0. So, <coughs> in the large limit, then x sense, you realize x sense, and this uh, random variable x also, they can differ. Okay? But their probability that they will differ becomes 0 as it tends to 0. So, this happens, we say it's convergent. Then there is one more thing. Mean squared number. Probability that x <coughs> minus x the whole square. Okay. Uh, sorry, expected. <coughs> Minus, uh, x minus x to whole square converts to 0 as n tends to So what it does is xn converges in, in such a manner that you can find x n minus x to whole square. They may be different, but if you look at that, the, those cases for which x n and x are different, there will be very, the probability is very less. So you are going to take case by case the x and minus x, the whole square and weighted by the probability and then doing, going to do a weighted average. That is what is the expectation. That will converge to zero. The probability that the difference becomes less. That is, if that is called as the, it's called mean square convergence. Then, convergence in distribution. This is, that is one, this is 
The second, this is the third way of conversion, then the fourth way. Just go ahead. Yes, xn of x will be the cdf of x. f x of x. You tell that it converges to a random variable x. Means that we have to give a distribution of this. These two functions become identical. <coughs> that is, if as f j c there will be a cdf of f x. Uh, it is just to be a monotonous, non-decreasing function only. Okay? It can be like that one. See, as m changes, this distribution will keep changing. It has to be a CDF. So, to begin with, it can be, it can, it can, it can take this form. After that, it will take this form. And then slowly, it will take this form like this one. In a large limit, it takes a form such that, that x also takes the same form. <coughs> Xn, Fxn and Fx are identical in every point. Okay. The function converges, what does it mean? Eh? You can take a function value A and B. You can evaluate Fxn at A. Fx at A. Okay? Again, this converges to this one. Because this is given x is given, x is the random variable, and whose cd of it represents, it is just a function. You can evaluate at any point, that will give you a number. <coughs> so this, this is sequence of numbers. This number converges to this number. In the same way, an ordinary number can, sequence converges in the reverse. So that function are the same. At every point, the function takes the same value. If that happens, then we say, it converges in this way. There are little technical, the way of y method depends the way it is and so on. How it can converge in this one, but it cannot converge in that and other, other ways of that. But it is better you just know that there are different ways of something. Further, it is also told that there are some of them that convergence is very strong, that some convergence are weaker. And uh, it may so happen that in your engineering application, uh, certain conversion <coughs> itself is good enough. And that is what is, uh, that what happens. You need not uh, expect some stronger conversion. What it means generally told you, uh, found out is, <coughs> convergence and distribution, which I will call it as D, okay, is a uh, larger set. Convergence in probability is a smaller set. That is, you can have certain uh, sequence of random variables such that they can convert to a particular random variable in distribution, but they won't converge in probability. The other way is, if they converge in probability, it means they will converge in distribution, but not the other way. Which means that this is a stronger convergence. And this is the mean square convergence and this is the A almost everywhere convergence. Which means that these are very strong convergence. If, if we say that it is almost everywhere convergence, definitely it will converge in probability, definitely it will converge in distribution. But not the other way. <coughs> these two does not imply the other one. So, so this is all about the convergence of and they are called as the stochastic convergence. behaves 
I want to simulate it, or that there is an experimentation that is happening. Okay, so I want to study it. Okay, then in that case, you may have to simulate certain random experiment and study. It. But the question arises: How do we simulate a random variable? So, for that, you will look at certain theories and then get can start up an algorithm or a method of generating random So by that what we mean is, suppose x is a random variable, then we have a density function f x of x and then the distribution of the effects of x. I should be able to generate samples <coughs> of x. I will call these samples as x1, x2, etc. Such that they are actually samples of the random variables. It's, it, what do we mean by generating samples of random variables? Suppose I know this random variable will take a value between 0 to 100. Arbitrarily picking some value between 0 to 100 may not characterize this random variable. Because if the probability of choosing a number between 90 to 100 is extremely large as compared to this one, our sample should be such that most of the time I will get samples in this way. Very rarely I should get a sample. That should be reflected by the sampling process. Then only I will tell that I am taking samples from X. Okay? Or other way what we will do is we can one way in which you can do is you take a large number of samples and then find how many of them you can divide the entire range okay, of whatever it takes into smaller bits and find how many of the samples fall in this one. You construct an histogram. How many fall in this one? You construct an histogram like this. And so on. And this should converge to what? The density function. Okay. So that is, this is how you can look for the uh, get the density function. That is, this is the range 0 to 100. You draw it to very, very smaller bits and then find the frequency distribution. Just nothing but the frequency distribution of the number of samples that fall in each of the bits. That you get. And then you normalize. You will get some values. That will be 1 lakh samples you will get. And here 7,000 may fall, here 13,000 may fall and so on. You construct this base, this one like that. And then you see that the area becomes 1. Then it will become the density form. That should happen. Then, or you find the expectation. That is what the same sample mean you find. That will converge to the expectation of ERS. You can find the variance of this one also. You find first the expectation which is mu. Then the x minus mu you find it. Square you find it. And then take the mean of that one. But that should converge to variance. These are different ways of checking whether your samples are all correct because they should represent this random value. So this is what how you should do. Now, <coughs> well, now generating a uniform random variable is first of all that seems to be rather uh, yeah, easy task to. First, uh, we can look into that. How do we generate a random number between 0 to 1? In a computer, if you want to suppose, you want to generate a random number between 0 to 1, okay, using a digital circuit, you would have all gone through this one. How do you think you can do it? Using just, you can also write an algorithm. Don't use any functions right now, as of now. Okay? If you want to, using a digital circuit, if you want to generate a random number, how, how do you think you can do it? Uniform continuous random number, but it will not be continuous because it is a digital circuit that is giving. Digital computer cannot reproduce real numbers. 
It will give you only with some approximation because of the finite register length problem is that it will always give like that. So how do we do it? What I would do is I will take a counter, small counter, small 16 counter or so. So we will have 16 bits. And then what I will do is I will initialize to 0 and run it at high frequency. Say 1 and a half clock. Okay. And if you model, you will go to all, all zeros, all ones, again all zeros and then so on. At any given time, if I look at it, it will be something like this one. I feed it to an uh, DAC, this will to another operator, I will get a number. Okay. That number you can is supposed to be a because this time at which I sample is a quite random. And you know the entire range of it, you derive that number by that entire range, it is supposed to be randomly distributed in this one and it is supposed to be uniform because the time at which I am going to sample is arbitrary. This is one way I think can be used to get a sample of a uniform distribution. Okay, and of course we have to divide it to lie between 0 to 1 with some precision. Not all real numbers are possible here, only certain discrete real numbers. 2 power 16, only equally spaced numbers in 0 to 1 range or can be generated. Beyond that, what do you do? I want a sequence, not just one cell. It's a key power sample. Okay? So that 10,000 samples you want to give, you keep on sample. Again, for that, I have to just look into that value, latch it. I can use another circuit to latch this number into another the register and then feed it to DAC <coughs> and the B. Periodically, I have to latch. For that, I have to use another clock to latch. I can use it to get this. But suppose I use a clock which is of 2 kilometers to sample it. Then there is a problem that I may get. If we so happen that the, 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 the time at which I samples are so periodic that way, okay, if I, for example, again at one hour, what happened is that I may be sampling at the same point again and again. Because by the time this counter goes back and comes here, it in my next sampling interval arrives. So I will be taking the same sample again and again. Here is that. Yeah. Or 2 mahats or 5 mahats again, I may be some over the entire range, I may be sampling here, here, again. Alternately, like that only, only at certain places I will be sampling. I may not even get the, uh, the uniform. So that is all very, very important. So it has to be spread out. Maybe some prime number and all, you may think that it will be used between this frequency and the sampling frequency in order to get samples and so on. So, but it can be done. Uh, you may know that the RAND method is that usually the computer program will, it will give you a sample between 0 and 1. There are some algorithms like box mirror <coughs> algorithm which can again be used to get this. So right now we will assume that generating this uniform 0 1 is something that is possible. <coughs> okay. Now my question is, I have a random variable yes, which is not necessarily unique. Some random variable, Gaussian distribution, exponential, Rayleigh, Cauchy, or some distribution, and I want samples of that. Okay, how do we generate for an arbitrary distribution? So this is what we will just look at. So before that, what we will do is select u of 0, 1, okay, uh, let u be a random variable, which is uniform 0, 1. I will introduce uh, this, uh, some notation, u1, u2, by that I mean samples <coughs> of this random variable, uniform random variable, u1, u2, and so So, <coughs> if I have any other random variable x, which is a function of u, I will put g, g of u, then by feeding these random variables, I can generate samples of this function 
past where I'm the baby is. That should be obvious. Because you and you two are something, we are very representative of this discussion. And I take you and you two, they are all uniformly coming from 0 to 1. I am defining a random variable with gx, which is g of u. So, what it means is, I will generate a set, uh, sample sequence. For every sample, I will feed it into this function, g of g, g of u1, g of u2, and so on. So, these will be samples x1, x2, that all samples of this question. That should be obvious. So this is something that we should understand. So we will call these as samples of uniform distribution, samples of an <coughs> arbitrary distribution which we are So this, so I can, by using this function, I can generate different random variables. For example, if I say 2x plus 3, then it will be, uh, so 2u plus 3, then it will be a random variable x, which will be 2u plus 3. The mean will be shifted and it will be stretched and so on. So I can generate by defining different functions I can do. For example, if I treat this u to be some theta, okay, uniform between minus pi to plus pi, and then define sin theta, x equal to sin theta, then I will be able to generate random number x, okay, which is of sin theta. Those things are all positive. But the question is, I give a function, I will generate samples of that random variable which I But I have a random variable with whose distribution function I know. That is what is I have it in my mind. How do I generate? For that, there should be a function which if I use it and feed in this u1 to un into that one, then it will give you x1 to xn sequence which are all samples of that function. So, given the function, even the random variable and the <coughs> CDF, how do we come up with a function which will mimic the generation of the samples of this random variable? That is the whole point. Okay. So, what this, this, there is a method that tells this. function u of x. What is the how, how do you define it? It is 1 
for x lying between 0 and 1, 0 or twice. And then so this is means say f u of u is the uniform function. Then how is f u of u? 0 for u less than or equal to 0. u for u <coughs> this is the CDF of u. We know that. Now, let's look at what will happen if you compute So what it is, 
simply get to this. The senior of uh, X is nothing but the function evaluator of X. Okay. Therefore, X is where X has a distribution which is given by this one. Therefore, X, we are, the X will have a property that uh, its CDF is Fx of X with which we start. So this is how we can you, you, uh, generate any distribution of uh, whose CDF is one. What you have to simply do is, you have to generate samples of uh, uniform random variable, feed it into F inverse, where F is the CDF function of this. We'll stop.